I can talk. And that is why in this episode I will try to explain what I'm doing because part of you might be a little bit disappointed that I didn't on the previous build. So, since we are going to make Damascus again, of course, who don't love Damascus, come on. Um, I will try to focus on the process, uh, which might be a little bit confusing because I don't want to make a mosaic. I'm going to make a star Damascus, but this is not going to be a pattern well that's still like most people do when they make the Star Damascus. I want to create something a little bit more fancy and unusual. Damascus steel mean the prep work. So I clean all the pieces, stack it together and then forge weld. First forge welding session is the hardest one because you actually forge weld over a dozen steel plates. Many things can go wrong so this is actually the most stressful moment. With my true hate of flax, I use it a lot. It's eating the forge fast, but also protect the steel from oxidation. And in case of 100 bucks in steel, it is the sacrifice I can live with. After the billet is welded, I'm turn down the gas pressure and start forging. You don't want to work uh, in white hot forge all the time. Forge welding temperature is uh, critical to the steel and um, in this state it can easily crack and even if it doesn't, the grain structure goes to super coarse texture and to reduce it you need to forge it right. And by right I mean the right range of temperature. If you go too high it is bad. Same as cold forging. If you forge it right, you actually crush the crystals and make them smaller. The first forging session is done. And this is another important moment. Clean the steel from the slug. There's a few things I've noticed. One of it is that the angle grinder can be very helpful for searching the lamination. You will literally see red hot steel under the disc grinder if there is some oxide underneath. Another thing is if you don't know how the steel should look like before the next session, the answer is simple. Same as on the first one. There should be no black lines, the surface should be clean and it should look like a mono steel bore. This is how the pattern looks so far. This is not exactly C pattern, it looks more like an S pattern, but for the end result I'm looking for, it is okay. To those four pieces of Damascus, I add another set of bearing steel. The whole idea is to create isolated star Damascus. I will explain it when the billet is done. If dice of your press are too small, you need to set the welds in more than one press move. Sometimes it can uncover the steel that is not forge welded yet and create a gap between the plates where the air, our enemy, can get in. This is why I use the big flat dice. With those, I can press the whole billet and no air gets in. And because the welding don't require high pressure, big dices works just fine. I compress the billet to make it square and long, and the big flat dice are super helpful also when the bar is bent. Um, and actually it bends naturally, so I'm using it many times for many things. After the bar is right dimensions, I re-square it again and you can make it with flat dices by pressing the corners of the billet or you can use the dice with 45 degree angle sides 
and make it in one move. This creates quarter of the star. What we got is one quarter of the star and you probably don't see a thing, but trust me, it is one quarter of the star. Uh, I am not going to make a typical star because I don't want to, but what we are going to do is we... I'm alone here. Come on. I'm going to uh, weld those two pieces, create half of the star, and then the whole magic wheel happened. Because I'm going to cut off part of the billet during the forging. And it is because one thing. If I compress the billet and make it a little bit more like this, the star gonna be like this. If I compress the one side create the integral bolster, then increase the length and create the blade. The blade, sorry, the blade gonna be looks like this. So this is gonna be the star, but I don't want to make this area black. I want to make the pattern from the spine to the part of the bevel. And that is why I need to remove this material during the forging. After I remove it, the top of the bullet became, became the spine and this area gonna be pushed and this is gonna be exactly this part of the knot. So, I believe that this is gonna be something like semi sunmai with Damascus scales, but on the integral bolster. There's a better way to make the pattern like this. Overall, I will cut off a lot of good material. However, I can use only tools I have, and this limits the options a lot. So, right now, I cut the handlebar and stack it to another side of the billet. It is because I need to compress the bar the way that the half star became the side of the knife. In effect, this is the most extreme way of moving steel. If the welds are not 100% good, the lamination is more than inevitable. In case of this kind of compression, you need to make it in many steps and keep the bar hot. I mean bright orange, so the upper range of the forging temperature. And also, you need to control the torsion, or let's say, the twist. If you press too much your billet, and it became the rhombus, not the square, you will have a huge problem to fix it. And if you leave it like this, the pattern will be asymmetrical. And in this state, you don't want to hurry. Price is too high. The billet is compressed and actually I have absolutely no idea how the pattern looks like because there is a possibility that it get twisted uh, and this is not cool but still I believe that it can be saved um, and the second thing is I have absolutely no idea what is the orientation of the pattern uh, it can be like this way or this way and 
I believe it would be terrible mistake if I <laughs> forge the blade on the wrong side of the mm, billet. So uh, I'm going to clean it uh, and we will see what is inside. The billet looks exactly like I want it, so it goes to the forge again. Making an integral bolster knife, I start from forging the bolster. It must be square, and in fact, you need to isolate it first. Small flat dice I use isn't necessary. You can use some one quarter inch thick bar, um, put it on the bottom die, and it make the same thing. Next. I separate the blade from the bolster and there's many ways to make it. I don't like bolster that goes perpendicular to the blade, so I set the billet at an angle, but no matter how you design the bolster shape, the place where you press the bar and creating the ricasso should be in front of the cube you isolated on the first step. The biggest mistake is to press the billet too close to the bolster because you need to have the material to create the heel of the knife and that is why this line should be before the compressed square cube which became a bolster i'm cutting off the steel i don't want on my knife when the blade is not defined yet blade is still about half inch thick and this gives me a big merging so I can forge the blade how I want. Because not everything can be made with the press, I take a hammer and forge tip of the blade by hand. Here is the moment I press the steel and make a heel of the knife. This is exactly the reason why you need to find the ricasso a little further than you think it should be. We've got the forged blade and I know that I didn't forge the tongue but there is one reason why I didn't and I will explain it later. So right now I believe that the pattern starts here and goes just to the integral bolster uh, but we will see after I clean it, grind it and make it a little bit more like a knife. plan for the next step is to clean a little bit the uh, bolster and then uh, probably I'm going to make the tongue and yes there will be a hole then I will solder or um, brace the rod to the integral bolster and this is how I make the tongue and for those who just cannot accept the fact that this is completely and 100% solid connection between the handle and the bolster or let's say rest of the knife, I assure you that if some part of the knife 
get broke, broken, this is gonna be the space between the bolster and the blade, so the recasso. There is absolutely no chance to break a handle. It is absurd. So that is why I believe that this method um, is a really good one if you don't want to make just straight line between the handle and the bolster. Um, making it, making the curvy line uh, between the handle and the bolster with the tongue, which is the same piece of steel, then the rest of the knife would took like forever. So that is why I believe that this is a better solution. And also, I am not the only one who make this kind of stuff. Many knife makers, uh, which makes amazing stuff, use this method and it works no matter what kind of knife it is. Unfortunately, I don't have milling machine, but I can use the carbide bits and mill the bolster by hand. So this took way too long. So I'm going to normalize it and anneal this piece because it is a little bit too hard. And then I make a second side, which right now is untouched. Okay, now I'm going to cut straight the end of the poster, then I'm going to make a hole, then I'm going to grind this fancy curve and attach the rod to the bolster. See? This is why I always have a hat. I mean hood. And this guy. This is not a joke. This is 36 grit. I just hit, get hit super hard on this uh, mask. It was like someone just hit you in the face. In fact, this wasn't the first time I got hit by the belt uh, that just got broken. So guys, please be careful. It is not a joke, the belt grinder is dangerous. 
and if you walk alone like I do, the PP is necessary. We've got roughly grinded blade, we've got hole to the tank, and we've got our tank. The uh, plan is to use this beautiful stabilized maple uh, and create a handle. And I've prepared a drawing, so this is gonna be something like this. And this is a good moment to make a confession. I have this obsession. I hate straight lines. There is something on the knives I make that disqualifies straight lines between the parts. I just want to keep consistency and the straight lines does not match. This is why I avoid them. And this is why these stupid fittings take days, not hours in my case. If you are curious how long does it take to make the perfect fitting on this kind of curvy line, the answer is too long, way too long. It gets warped a little bit to one side because the pattern is asymmetrical and I can understand that, this is pretty natural, but after the tempering cycle it is uh, straight, it is good. So I can move to the next step which is the final grinding. And this is another thing, I've changed the blade shape because I didn't like the edge curve that wasn't parallel to the border of the pattern. Uh, another obsession. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hand sanding. Boring. Skip it. I didn't have plan for the handle. I just go with the flow and uh, I believe that sometimes it works really good. And also I just didn't know how to make the cool looking handle with the integral bolster because I didn't make any integral bolster in my life. So this is why I decided to just you know, go with the flow. Okay, so, right now we've got something that looks like this and I wanted to keep it as thin as possible because it is relatively high in this area. And the thing is that it looks good, it looks okay, but I don't like the pommel. I think it is too big. Uh, it should be at least about maybe a little more than half of it. So um, I need to fix it. And after this going to be a little bit more um, tempered, I believe. I, be I think it is going to be the final shape of the knife. 
And as you can see, no gap. The only issue is here because there is some um, crack on the wood. So I'm going to fill it, but we are going to make it a little bit later. So guys, the knife is ready. If you enjoyed this episode, give it a thumbs up. And if you want to see the next build, subscribe to the channel. This is all, have a great day, and we see you on the next one.